Welcome to the Terminal Value Podcast. We have Beate Chalette with us today. And uh, her website, I'm going to give it to you at the beginning and then again at the end, just so that everybody remembers it, is B-E-A-T-E-C-H-E-L-E-T-T-E.com. That's BeateChalette.com. And what we're going to be talking about today is actually figuring out a differentiation strategy for your company. And because, of course, you know, everybody, well, you know, everybody, well, not everybody, um, but. business literature for a long time has been talking about the importance of differentiation. And, you know, essentially what differentiation means is you have to figure out what makes you different, unique, special versus anything else that somebody else could do in your industry or in the case of if you're talking about like a business to consumer just with their money. At least what I found is that in a lot of cases, big net differentiation can be a little harder than it might think, although than you might think, although Beate would uh, disagree with me. She says it actually does not have to be difficult (laughs) unless you make it so. So uh, Beate, A, don't let me talk too much and B, you know, just just go into, just Just, run with it. (laughs) Yeah, just run with it. Exactly. Well, first of all, thank you for having me on your show. I'm, uh, I'm happy to be here. And yes, I think it does not have to be very difficult. It is just that most people make it very difficult. And why? Yeah. If you want to grow your authority, scale your impact, you need to stand out. And how do you stand out? Well, if that was so easy, everybody would just do it and say, here, this is who I am. This is what I do. And people would just love you because they'll see exactly how authentic and real you are. In reality, that is not so. In reality, what happens is that we get beaten out the differentiation factor as we go through our our professional career, our business career, because we go and we go to this conference and that conference. We listen to 60 different people and they all tell us 60 different things. And they all all end up in the same conclusion. If you buy my product, you'll know everything and you're going to be rich forever. Well, of course. And that, yeah. It, right? Isn't that always how it works? <laughs> the, yeah, exactly. Just buy my course and then you'll be fine. So the way I approach this is that number one, it is probably going to be difficult for us to see about ourselves what we are yeah. good at because we live in this body. This is our life. We don't even see oftentimes what it actually is. So there's a couple of mm-hmm. pointers I have for your listeners. Number one, I recommend to ask people, what do they like about you? What yeah. makes you stand out? And I give you an example. So I did this as a, an event for Merck Pharmaceuticals. And it was about, we call this in, in growth architecture. So I am the growth architect, Beat Chalette, and I help visionaries and leaders yeah. to grow their authority and scale their impact. And so I facilitated this conversation about the unapologetic value proposition. And so there's this wonderful gentleman that walks in the room and everyone's like, hey, John, no, come on, John, sit over here, John. Oh, John, hey, how are you? And it just, John, 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 John. And we talk about, hey, what makes you so special and unique? What do other people say about you? And he sits there with a blank stare on his face and he goes, I don't know. I don't stand out. And I said, well, watching you walk into this room what stood out for me is that clearly everybody likes you. And he goes like, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. I said, so would it be appropriate to assume that you could go in any meeting, in any conversation, and you are the peacemaker, the guy that brings the motivation, the guy yeah. that brings the energy to the room? And he says, well, yeah. And I said, well, there it is. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Hello. And he goes like, but doesn't everybody know how to do that? And I said, that is the biggest min- misconception. So to point out the obvious, when it is so obvious to you that you go, doesn't everybody know how to do yeah. that? That generally hints on a super skill that you have yeah. because it is so normal to you that you go, but doesn't everybody know how to do that? So for me, it was because I like strategy. So the more people Mm -hmm. throw at me, the more my brain starts to work. And then suddenly it spits out a system. It just can't help itself. Yeah. Or when I hear something, when I hear something or I read something, then immediately my brain goes to work, says, oh, oh, that is so clear to me that I I have to call this person and tell them. And then people say, well, what, what made you, what made you recognize that? I said, I don't know. Doesn't everybody know how to do that? Ah, super skill. So you want to look at. A super skill is not something necessarily you spend 10,000 hours to do. A super skill could be something that is so innately comfortable to you that you don't give it any value because it is so easy. So that's the first giveaway. 
Well, and so, actually, I, I want to unpack that. Go ahead, that, go ahead, I, dive in. I, I want to unpack that 10,000 hour idea because there was one thing I read recently. It was actually on, uh, just recently read James Altucher's book, uh, Skip the Line. And there was one of the many things he said in there actually, you know, that really resonated with me is that, right, you know, if you go from say, you know, if you take uh, say a single skill and you want to be world-class, it's 10,000 hours, right? Well, but if you take the intersection of two skills, now that goes down to about a hundred hours because there are not there just because the population that you're competing against gets lower. If you take the intersection of three skills, that goes down to a hundred hours. And if you're taking the intersection of like four or more skills, you're talking about an afternoon. And so the a part of you know what to think about too is not just okay, how do I become the best in the world at one thing? It's to say, okay, what is a combination of skills I already have? that, uh, you know, that other people are not building their differentiation around. I think that's actually a way that a lot of people who are, say, you know, mid, you know probably mid-career or later, they will almost certainly have an intersection of a half dozen skills that they are pretty good to really good at, that they can combine in a way that will essentially create a competition-free zone. Yes. And I'm going to add to that. I thought that was brilliant. What happens now is that at this intersection, when people come to me, I have a program called the growth system. And so it's a system formula builder. And that works a lot for coaches, consultants, service providers, marketers, podcasters, because they have knowledge of so much. Yeah. They're challenged to take all of this and put it under one umbrella. So then if somebody comes to them, they would say, well, I can help you with that, but I can also help you with that. I can also help you with that. I can also help you with that. And then the person says, yeah, but I don't, I don't know. I don't, I don't know. I mean, I'm coming to you as the expert, you know, why don't you tell me? And that's when transactions oftentimes don't happen is because the service provider assumes that the person who comes to them knows what's wrong. If they knew what was wrong, they would fix it on their own. They wouldn't need you. So as service providers or as people that are helping others, it is our job now to figure out what is the umbrella. And I'm going to give you an example for that. So, you know, as a strategist, so you would say, yeah, but what strategies do you devise? I would say, well, that depends. What strategy do you need? So now we are Uh in that, I have no idea what she does most. But if I say that if you are overwhelmed, you're running out of time, you are, uh, you can't squeeze any more time out. You're working 16 hours, but you did this to get freedom, Mm -hmm. right? I mean, you're doing this because you want the freedom. But now you're enslaved. You're the slave to your business because you don't have a strategy. Now, suddenly the strategies in relationship to an emotional problem. Uh-huh. But now, you know that I understand the problem that you're having. And now if I mention what I do, you automatically make the connection that the strategy I will suggest will help you to actually figure out the strategy to get to the freedom. Yeah. So in the language that we have to design as our differentiation factor, it has to be clear what is the problem that you are actually going to be able to solve with what you're really good at. Mm-hmm. So, so the first part is, what am I really good at? The second part is, who has the problem? Yeah. And then how can I solve the problem? So there's three pieces to it. And when you are connecting these, like almost like over matching, you know, like you put the three circles yeah. on top of each other, the piece in the middle, that's the sweet spot that your offer should be going in. And then your differentiation factor suddenly is not so difficult anymore. So I've done this with, just to give you another example. So I I did this with a client who is in coaching. Now, if I were to say she's a coach or even an executive coach, then people would say, yeah, I mean, how many thousands of coaches are out there? I mean, there's no differentiation factor in coaching. Well, I was going to say, that I, I'm going to take a cheap shot at the coaching profession, but, but I was going to say, course, you know, um, at least my observation is that a lot of people in coaching are about coaching other people to be coaches, just like a lot of the people who are influencers on social media, their business is teaching other people how to be influencers. And I was like, well, what if I want to learn how to do social media just to like, like have a like normal business? Is there, is there anybody who does that? <laughs> As a matter of fact, I do that because I, you know, but, but we'll get to that. So I want to just get back to this example so that your listeners can put this in perspective. And so when I spoke to her, what I found is that she had a system that she had in her head that hadn't been really clearly defined. 
she works a lot with emotional intelligence. Uh And so we found that when she was talking about, she says, well, right now in the stress that we under, we need to take care, not of the people in the C-suite first. We need to take care of the people who are on the front line doing the work first because they've been on the front line the entire time. They're absolutely exhausted. They're burned out. They're emotionally spent. Yeah. They want to quit. They want to run away. They're underpaid. They yelled at, spit at, hit. You know, they've been they've yeah. been taking all the abuse. So when we picked out her differentiation factor, we said that she works with companies that rely on a large number of frontline workers uh-huh. who are at or beyond burnout to help them to regain balance. And that her method was to go from the bottom up and not from the top down. Okay. Now we have a differentiation factor. So now if you talk to this coach, you know what she's doing. Well, and then I, I would say that, you know, and then if you, if you layer on top of that, a unique selling proposition, you know, and that's, I, I can't take credit for this one. Well, I think it probably actually goes to before Dan Kennedy, but I first heard of the U- idea of the USP from Dan Kennedy, which is where, which is to say, you know, why should I do business with you as opposed to all other options available, including doing nothing? <laughs> you know, I think that, you know, when you layer uh, that USP on top of that differentiation factor, I think now you have a very compelling marketing message because you know precisely who you need to target and you have a precise message that you can send to them instead of saying, hey, I'm a business and I work in your area, come talk to me. You know, you'll have, you'll get some conversions with that. But if you were extremely targeted and saying, this is exactly what I'm going to offer you, and this is exactly why you should do it with me, and this is exactly why it's better than doing nothing. And by the way, I'm going to guarantee results, you'll get a much higher, get, you'll get a much higher response rate. You're absolutely correct, Doug. And what goes with that is also the confidence of the value mm-hmm. proposition. We call it in growth architecture, the unapologetic value proposition. Yeah. It's still a USP because it is about you showing up and owning who you are. Uh-huh. And, and a lot of people, and I'm, I bet you, get in, you, you come across this all the time too, people are nervous if somebody doesn't like them or doesn't want their service. Well, our job is to help people to understand if we are the right fit or if we're not. So if somebody says no, mm-hmm. our objective is also achieved because we just eliminated who is not our client. So in this value proposition or in this idea about talking or demonstrating why me, you have to have something other than describing the actual service. You have to describe what the end result is that you bring and who you're, who you're helping. Yeah. I I like that. Yeah. This is yeah, well, and I think you said it earlier, which is to really clearly define the, you know, describe the problem that you are solving and why it is that you are able to solve that problem in a way that is unique. Yes, exactly. And that means that you have to actually understand the problem that your clients are having. And that is another piece that I would highly recommend mm-hmm. is to listen to what your prospects are saying. And when they go like, if I only would, you know, like what you just said a minute ago, when you said, oh, if only somebody would just teach regular business owners on how to be better at social media. Well, guess what? I've heard this so many times that I, I created a mastermind program around that, which is helping people to design the workflow because we have a, you know, I'm a strategist. So I mean, workflow, that's like my dream, you know, please anybody say process system strategy and I'm right there. And, but you can't stop there. Then we teach your VA how to do it. And if you don't want your VA to do it, then you can tell us and we'll, we'll put someone on the project, but you have to understand exactly what people are going through and what they need, and then look at your skill set and say, well, but I have that. I've already created all of that. What if I could help other people to also have two pieces of content and 50 touch points per week and save them Mm -hmm. 15 hours? Would that be, would that be valuable to you? Yeah. And then people say, oh my God, that exists. So that's how you have to listen intently to when you speak to prospects or you hear other people speak, what are they actually saying? 
So yeah. it's not that you are a coach. It's not that you're a consultant, but what is the problem that they're experiencing and what does it mean for them? It means that you're spending 15 hours a week on stuff you should not be spending your time on because you mm -hmm. should be on the phone prospecting and closing big deals. You should not be sitting there doing audiograms and posting graphics and snippets and tagging people. You should do none of that. I would say yes. And I would actually take what you would, what you, what you would say almost to another level. And that, you know, I would actually say that, you know, what, what you really want to be doing is figuring out how to get the, to get those big deals to come to you so mm -hmm. that instead of you having to go out, chase, hunt, kill is that in, you know, is to substitute marketing for that manual effort and put a system in place. So you have like, for example, a sales funnel so that you can identify, you know, get people to self-identify, take them through a warming up process. And then, yeah. And then by the time you talk to them, they already know who you are, already know what you do and are already predisposed to want to work with you because they, they already feel comfortable with what you're doing. Now, of course, that's a lot of work to set up, but I would actually argue that should be the goal. And, you know, because I think what you're talking about is that almost that, you know, kind of that value ladder of activities, right? And as a part of running a business, there's, I don't know, probably about 10 to 20 kind of full-time equivalent headcount worth of activities that need to happen. And so you need to figure out some combination of technology, of outsourcing, and possibly employees to make all of that work. And I think- well, that's yeah. Yes. Yes. And so here's the, the way we, I look at this as a, yeah. as a growth architect, you look at your business in this circular activity. Yeah. So I've designed something called the five-star success blueprint. And so we diagnose where the issues are in a business very quickly. It's either with the idea, the offer, the system, the team, or the leader, and you are needing a strategy for all of these. So the funnel is only one part of the strategy when you have the yeah. offer. Yeah. You still need a strategy for the idea. You still need a strategy for the system. You mm -hmm. need multiple strategies because when you have the offer, then that's where the sales funnel comes in, the lead generation, the ads, yeah. the however you're going to get people in the funnel. The social media strategy is now when we are going uh, further down the road in leadership, because that's how we're building authority. Uh -huh. It's now we have the system that's working, but how do people learn about you? So you don't want to do that in the beginning. You want to do that when you're really stepping into leadership and you can scale this up because now you're scaling up. So you also have to be very clear where in your business to provide that terminal value to uh -huh. your customers. Where does which strategy go? And when is which strategy appropriate? I recommend that every business should have a strategy per quarter. So if you have a problem with lead generation, your next quarter should be focused obsessively over fixing your lead generation. If you have a, a problem with a sales funnel, the next quarter after the lead generation is conversion and yeah. closing. So yeah. that you get in the habit, not of thinking the one thing is going to fix it all, but which strategy do I need to do next to get me to my goal? I think that's a really great idea. I mean, because, and of course, because right, you know, when you're, when you're first starting out your business, you have a whole bunch of stuff you have to try to get together all at once. And so even if you get one part to where it works passively, it's probably going to be a good idea to come back to it in a few months to quarters, because there's almost certainly a way that it can be, you know, improved very significantly based on all of the other improvements you've made as you've been going along. 100%. You're absolutely correct. But perfection is not our goal. Getting it done is our goal. Because you can't, you, you can't get it right the first time unless you have the data that shows you on whether or not it actually works. Once you know that it works, then and only then can you go back and tweak it. But you know, some people spend two years on getting the right logo. And some people just waste time on stuff. You got to get the leads in, got to get the conversion going, got to get the sales, get the cash flow going, and then build the business up. As I'm fond of saying, you know, until you sell something, you don't have a business, you have a hobby. I really like that quote <laughs> of yours. Yes. <laughs> okay. Yeah. yeah. And, and that's one of the things that I always think to myself too. I'm like, okay, you know what? This, this stuff's all great, but you've got to sell something because until that happens, you don't have a business. <laughs> 100%. You got to focus on where are they? Yeah. How am I going to get the, them interested? What am I going to sell them? How am I going to close? What do I deliver so that they're happy? And how do I turn them into repeat customers? Yeah, exactly.
Precisely. Precisely. Well, I think that's actually, I was going to say, that feels like a pretty good conclusion point. Yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, Cause yeah, I always like to end on a high note. I'm a, I'm an old school Seinfeld fan. So I keep thinking of the, you know, George Costanza where, you, yeah, know, yeah, as soon yeah. as he, uh, you know, as soon as he gets everybody to laugh as a joke, he just leaves the room. Always end on a high note. But I think, you know, before we actually end, end, give us one or two last insights. Uh, and then uh, uh, again, uh, let everybody know your website again. So they'll know where to find a little more. Yes, of course. So my biggest insight probably that I've learned is don't take failure personal. Look at failure as somebody yeah. with a stop sign standing there and just uh, telling you that this is the wrong way. Like you wouldn't drive with a car into with an outdated GPS in now what is a cul-de-sac and you wouldn't throw yourself on the ground and throw a temper tantrum. You just get back in the car and turn around and find another yeah. way. So look at failure at it as, as the same kind of thing. And the second thing is if you're thinking about failing, make sure it's big enough to fail because it's only worth it if it's big enough to fail. Okay. I was going to say, yeah, yeah. Uh, unpack that a little bit when you say, make sure it's big enough. Yeah, to fail. I, 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 know what I you refer mean, to it. I want it, to make sure everybody gets I, it. I refer to it, Doug, as if you drown, don't drown in a puddle, drown in the ocean. At least yeah, it's right. worth it. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Exactly. All right. And uh, let's see. And so your website, at least. Yeah. At least so my from, website from is, Bea- is beatashillette.com. So you can find me there. You can also check out my podcast, which is the best. Business Growth Architect Show. And for those of you who want to know what the three essential foundational elements are to grow your authority, you can go to successblueprint.biz and pick up my guide that teaches you what these three elements are. All right. Excellent. So that's beatesholette.com, successblueprint.com, and it was .biz. .biz. So apologies. And then your podcast again was that was the Business Growth Architect Show. Business Growth Architecture. All right. Well, Beate, really appreciate you having you on the show today. And I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you, Doug, for having me. It was my pleasure. Thank you for listening to the Terminal Value Podcast. Please feel free to visit me online at www.terminalvalue.biz, where you can subscribe, find me on social, and then we can connect and just keep the conversation going. I'm really looking forward to hearing from you, and I hope you have a wonderful day. All rights reserved. No part of this broadcast may be produced in any form by any means without written permission from Business of Life, LLC. All trademarks and brands referred to herein are the property of their respective owners.